My mom kidnapped me, brainwashed me against my dad, and now I'm seeking justice for the trauma she caused. As a young child, I trusted my mom completely. I believed everything she said because, after all, she's my mom. She wants what's best for me and loves me more than anyone else in the world. I never imagined that this innocent and natural perception would be exploited to such an extent. On my third birthday, my father stood waiting for me outside of McDonald's. He had planned my birthday party, but I never attended. He waited and called, but she never showed up. Meanwhile, she was boarding a Greyhound bus with me. The passengers learned it was my birthday, likely because she told them she was escaping an evil man. One passenger bought me a small birthday cake at one of the stops, according to my mom. I wonder where that person is now. If only they knew I was being taken away, and it wasn't a happy day to celebrate, but a day that would change the course of my life. Once we arrived on the other side of the country, she entered into domestic violence programs and changed both my name and social security number. Then she began to fill my developing and innocent mind with her grandiose lies. At three and a half years old, she told me she had saved me from my father. She said he was an evil man who was physically and emotionally abusive. She told me he had harmed me inappropriately. She also said that if I ever met him, he would kill her and take me to Africa, where my family would hurt me. By this time, my infantile amnesia had kicked in, and I forgot everything before this point. I forgot my dad. I forgot what he looked like. I forgot our bond. I forgot that I was a daddy's girl. I forgot that I couldn't sleep without him. Yet, even though I had forgotten him, there was an intuition that led me to become very misbehaved purposely toward my mother. I felt rage towards her, but I didn't know why. That's when the physical punishments began. Daily spankings, biting, and fingers being bent back. Trauma symptoms kicked in. I began to wet the bed, something I didn't do anymore, even at this young age, and night terrors about witches and running away became regular by the time I was five years old. Then came the hallucination of a demon telling me to harm myself. I gathered knives under my bed, not fully knowing why but feeling compelled to listen to this presence in my room. How does a baby already want to die? It was because I was dying. Then I was dead. My old self, along with my old name, was gone. In its place was a traumatized and angry shell of a child. The old me would forever remain a voice in my mind, screaming to be let out, to be free, to be allowed to be myself. I hated the person she forced me to become. I hated myself. My mom met her new husband and told me to call him dad. I did for a few days, but something felt wrong. I stopped, and for the rest of my life, she would refer to him as your dad. She pressured me to take his last name. She told him I misbehaved because she didn't punish me, feeling bad that I didn't have my dad. In that reality, I was punished so often that I grew to see her as an enemy worth fighting. Once he arrived in my life, the physical punishments became less frequent, and he became the one to discipline me. Much more level-headed, he would usually ground me. I would often take my frustration out on him, saying, you're not my dad. Time passed and I engaged in minor misdeeds like stealing makeup, which earned me a year-long grounding. Eventually, everything was taken from me, my phone, TV, computer, and any other devices. I was told I could have them back when I bought my own. Realizing I had no positive reinforcement to behave, by my teens, I had essentially defeated my mom's punishments. I would go out and not come home for days, drink, and engage in risky behavior. My mom wasn't interested in my life. She only shamed me for my actions, regularly calling the cops on me for minor offenses like drinking and smoking. Time after time, I would feel overwhelming anger and despair, thinking to myself, I just want my dad, not even knowing who I was longing for. I didn't realize that these were forms of covert abuse masked as discipline. I became the problem child she would gossip about to anyone who would listen, telling them how mentally ill I am and how hard it is for her as my mother. In trouble again and again, she would say, how could you after everything I've done for you? I risked my life to keep you safe. You're just like your dad. Soon you'll be 18 and you need to find somewhere else to live because I'm moving across the state. As 18 approached, I felt the fear of abandonment growing and knew I had to do something or I would be on the street. The day after my birthday, I was lured by a stranger on Craigslist claiming to have a room to share. He attacked me. It turned out he was a repeat offender and there were other victims. While the court process began, I found a roommate, a friend from high school. My mom, stepdad, and little brother had moved away and they rarely called. I felt safe enough to start looking for my dad. I found him on Facebook and sent him a message. This is where my suspicions began. He told me he had been looking for me, that he loved me, 
and that he was hurt every time my birthday came around. He was so distressed that he told people I had died because he couldn't explain that my mom had taken me whenever someone asked where I was. He was shocked when I asked him about her allegations of assault. His wife and new daughters defended him, saying my mom was absolutely lying. He bought tickets for me and my best friends so I wouldn't feel alone. Meeting him was a beautiful memory filled with happy tears. However, my intense emotions and bad behavior became too much for him. He got me a ticket back home, saying I was just like my mom. No one was with me in court when I faced my attacker. He received 56 years, the only justice I ever had. Someone suggested I include his name as proof, but I don't feel obligated to prove my story. I just wanted to get it off my chest. However, for the sake of transparency and because I believe in exposing wrongdoers, his name is Jose Omar Ortiz in Oregon if you want to read the news article. Two years passed before we both apologized to each other. He told me it was his biggest mistake and that he would forever be sorry. An apology? Very unusual. My mom had never apologized to me for anything. I felt seen and validated. Our relationship remained distant, but he was supportive, helping me many times when I was in a financial crisis or a difficult relationship. My mom was never willing to help me. I learned not to ask for help or tell her about my problems. The conflicting stories created cognitive dissonance that I couldn't resolve. It drove me mad, not knowing who was telling the truth. Someone had to be lying. I made excuses for my mom, wondering if maybe she was right and my dad had deceived me. I was scared to confront her because I didn't want to blame the victim if I was wrong. If I was mistaken, it meant she had been mistreated and was a victim herself. I had no memory, so how could I tell? but their behaviors told a story I couldn't ignore. I never felt loved by my mom, whereas my dad had empathy for me. He was interested in my life and helped me when I needed him, qualities my mom completely lacked. My boyfriend told me, it's obvious who is wrong. The more I studied her behavior, I saw consistent manipulation patterns, victim mentality, guilt tripping, blame shifting, and then love bombing, all classic narcissistic traits. It has been nine years since I met my dad. Only a few days have passed since I realized my mom kidnapped me. She was the unstable one all along. She mistreated me psychologically, emotionally, and physically, and she neglected me. That realization is so overwhelming that I feel nothing but emptiness. I can hardly cry. Why is this my life? A life she curated for me. A few days ago, I went no contact and blocked her on everything. Despite barely speaking to me, her response was to call everyone she knows I know, asking, why did she block me? I can't figure it out as if my friends are her source of information. Now I'm looking into finding a lawyer. I've learned that there is no statute of limitations for federally kidnapping children across state lines. Since it involves multiple states, the FBI would investigate. I don't want to punish her. I just want acknowledgement of her disregard for my life. I struggle mentally and can't focus. I have trouble sleeping. I overthink and overcompensate. For as long as I can remember, I've had a troubling voice in my mind that tells me to harm myself. Initially, I wanted to punish that voice, but eventually, it was because life felt unbearable. The confusion drove me to the brink until I finally realized, all I ever wanted was a family and a home. I don't have practical dreams or career aspirations, I just want love. I need to rebuild myself into the person I was meant to be. I hope to become someone who inspires others like me. She changed my name, took away my family, my culture, my identity. She destroyed me. I will never be who I was meant to be. But I know I am not a troubled person. I am someone who is psychologically abused, who has empathy for others, who deserved a chance at peace, a chance she took from me. She took my true destiny and identity away from me, something I will never get back. One filled with family, love, and compassion. One where I would be validated and valued, one without mistreatment. She took so much from me, erasing an essential part of who I am. But she can't take my soul. Now, I know the truth and I know who I am. For those affected by parental alienation, kidnapping, or narcissistic abuse, I understand your pain. I am with you. You are not alone. They can destroy who we used to be, but they can't take our souls. After 14 years, I finally had my chance with Kimmy, but my performance anxiety left me humiliated and blocked. There was a girl in high school who transferred in halfway through 10th grade. Let's call her Kimmy. We hit it off immediately, and our flirtation progressed until summer break. For some reason, we didn't talk much during the summer, even though cell phones and MySpace were a thing, summer of 2006. No Facebook yet. When we returned to school in 11th grade, things picked up right where they left off, but it seemed like the time apart had intensified our connection. 
By the end of the first month of 11th grade, we were getting quite close in math class, often sneaking moments when the teacher wasn't looking. We likely would have taken things further in the coming weeks, but I ended up getting expelled due to an unrelated incident, and everything came to a sudden halt. We texted for a few days afterward, but the incident was so notorious in my school that it resulted in a letter being sent to all the parents, as well as an automated phone call. Her parents promptly forbade her from having any further contact with me. We reconnected just before my 21st birthday. She came to my party, and we ended up making out in my room while the celebration continued in the living room. She stopped things after her bra came off, saying she didn't want to go too far with people just outside the door. We agreed to meet up in a few days when we were both available again, but something came up. I got into a relationship right afterward, and by the time I was single again, she was dating someone new. This pattern continued for years, with one of us always being in a relationship whenever the other was single. We maintained a distant friendship for the next several years, with the main theme being that every year on my birthday, I would message her to ask if this was the year she would give me birthday intimacy. She would playfully respond, maybe next year, and we'd mildly flirt back and forth for a few texts. Some years, our only contact was this annual birthday conversation, and then we wouldn't talk again until the following year, repeating the cycle. On my 30th birthday, I was about nine months into a new relationship. However, my partner had recently decided to open it up. I sent Kimmy my annual birthday text, which had become more of a joke over the years. To my surprise, she responded, letting me know that her serious relationship had just ended and she was ready to finally make this happen. I was so surprised that I called her and we talked for about an hour. We agreed to meet up the following Wednesday. Over the next several days, we exchanged pictures and I realized she had only gotten more attractive over time. I hadn't seen her in person in nine years since my 21st birthday, and she didn't post much on Facebook, so I was unaware of how much she had changed. As the meeting approached, I began to panic. The buildup of a decade and a half, combined with our recent conversations, made me feel insecure. I worried that the actual experience would be underwhelming because of the high expectations. My performance anxiety manifested into a specific fear of not being able to last long enough. This fear was fueled by my concern that, because I had wanted this for so long, I might be too excited when the moment finally arrived. Mind you, I had never had an issue with finishing too quickly, and had always lasted a reasonable amount of time with my partners. This fear was completely unwarranted, but became a fixation. I sought advice from friends and the internet about how to last longer. The number one suggestion was to relieve some tension before meeting up with her to take the edge off, ensuring that the actual experience would last longer. Wednesday rolls around, and I follow the plan, heading over to pick her up for our date before we head to a hotel. We grab dinner in the tourist area and then decide to go mini-golfing. This leads to us walking around, catching up, and talking. We actually have a blast, but it ends up being several hours before we reach the hotel. I become concerned that so much time has passed that any benefits I had gained from preparing earlier are long gone, as I've had more than enough time to recharge. Almost as soon as we enter the room, she starts undressing and pushes me onto the bed. I quickly say I need to use the bathroom. Instead of using the bathroom, I take a moment to prepare myself again. I return to the room, and things start to get intense. It's go time, and nothing happens. Now I'm panicking, which only makes things worse, and I can't get any response. I realize it's because I just finished a few minutes before and need more time to recharge. So, I play it off by focusing on her, all the while trying to get anything to happen. I end up continuing far past the point of enjoyment for her until she stops me and asks if I'm ever going to proceed. At this point, I'm still not ready, but I think maybe if I try, it might help. So now I'm attempting to get things started, but it's not working. Eventually, I manage to get just a little progress and essentially move without really doing anything, then stop and just stare at her in complete defeat. She's very nice about it, but it's clear she's disappointed. I tell her I'm having performance anxiety and suggest we watch TV for a bit and try again later. She's visibly turned off at this point and politely says she's tired and thinks we should end the date. I practically beg her to let me try again, and in one last effort, I manage to achieve a semi and get into a sort of rhythm. It's the worst performance of my life, but I figure it's better than nothing. We get dressed, hug goodbye, and go our separate ways. 
The most humiliating part is going home and acting like everything is perfectly fine around my girlfriend. Even though we're in an open relationship, we don't talk about our escapades, and I definitely don't tell her about this monumental failure. A few days later, I decide to reach out to Kimmy to explain myself and find myself blocked. It's been four and a half years, and I'm now happily married to someone else. Today, I was reminded of a particular night because a mutual friend created a group chat on Messenger. Apparently, even if people have each other blocked on Facebook, they can still see each other on Messenger if they're both added to a group chat. As soon as I saw her name and profile picture in the chat, I felt my face turn red. The worst part is that I know she spoke poorly of me to some of our mutual female friends, a few of whom are also in the chat. She essentially told everyone that I couldn't perform for her and went on to say it was a huge disappointment. She even claimed I was the reason she decided never to reconnect with anyone she had a past interest in, a better in mind than actuality situation. My first thought was to remove myself from the group chat, but I decided to stick around since I doubt anything embarrassing will come from it. But who knows, maybe I'll have to write another one of these in a few days, depending on how things end up going. In summary, I believed that if I relieved myself before intimacy, I could last longer. However, I ended up unable to perform while trying to be intimate with a woman I had been interested in for 14 years. My sister-in-law went from asking for gaming advice to banning me from the family over a Nintendo Switch and some game recommendations. About three months ago, my sister-in-law reached out to me for advice on a game console for her daughter, my niece. She knows I'm a gamer, so it made sense for her to ask me. I carefully considered it and recommended a Nintendo Switch. After a week, my niece went to GameStop with her father to buy one, but she saw the price and made the responsible decision not to get it. It was touching to see her be so thoughtful and understand that $300 is a lot of money. They went home without the console. My family has always rewarded responsible behavior, so I thought I could do something special for my niece. I wasn't about to spend $300 on something my sister-in-law described as a recent interest, but I aimed to find a more affordable option that my niece would still enjoy. With my sister-in-law's approval, I bought my niece an Enburnic handheld gaming device and a backbone for her phone. They live about two hours away, but I waited until they visited to give the gifts in person. The way her face lit up will forever stay in my heart. It was truly a joy to watch her excitement as she played old games like Fester's Quest, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and Frogger, taking turns with her mom. Her father got involved too, checking out Tomb Raider on the device. As for the backbone, they waited until they got home to explore it. When they did, my partner shared texts and photos showing how incredibly happy my niece was with the gifts. I felt accomplished, my heart was full, and my niece was having her best summer. The thing is, you can't drop 6,280 games on a non-gamer and expect them to handle it. Talking to my sister-in-law, we all decided that I could offer recommendations occasionally. Maybe every few weeks, I'd send a text like, how was Disney Springs? It's been ages since I've been. Check out Mickey Mouse Capade on the Inburnic if you're excited about Disney right now. Those kinds of texts were well received at first, but my partner and I could tell that my sister-in-law didn't really want to be the middle person. My sister-in-law had never given me my niece's phone number, and frankly, I didn't really want it. I recognized that it would have been convenient to text my niece directly, but sensing the boundary, I decided to leave it up to her parents if it ever came up. However, my partner came up with an idea to start a group text that would include my partner, my sister-in-law, and my niece note that I am not included. This would allow me to relay game recommendations to my niece through my partner via the group text and my sister-in-law would still be aware of my recommendations without being responsible for them. Establishing this line of communication would allow me to get feedback from my niece regarding her gaming preferences. Maintaining a hands-off approach, I let my partner handle it. I'm not sure how the conversation went between her and her sister, but after a couple of weeks, I started wondering. My niece had been on the verge of potentially discovering a new passion, one that I had invested about $150 into. I didn't want her to lose that gaming spirit before it could blossom, and I didn't want to have wasted the money. Understand that at the time, my partner was going through a mental health crisis, so she was a bit of an unreliable narrator. Deciding not to add pressure upon a person in crisis, I texted my sister-in-law directly, have you given any thought about the group text option? 
She replied to me in a group text with my partner and told us she was sick of me constantly asking about texting her daughter. I never asked to text her daughter. I don't know what was discussed between my partner and her sister, as I'm not the type to look at her phone, but the idea of me directly texting her daughter was something I never suggested. Yet, my sister-in-law insisted that I had asked about it multiple times. I asked her to send a screenshot of what she was talking about, and of course, she could not produce one. My sister-in-law suddenly became very hostile, like a switch was flipped, and she turned into a completely different person. My heart broke as I realized I didn't know this person anymore. She told me to drop it, that her daughter was never interested in gaming, that she didn't want to see me anymore, and that I'm not to buy any more gifts for my niece ever. Remember, this started with my sister-in-law asking me for advice, which I gave, and then facilitating my niece's interest only when my sister-in-law gave me the green light. After about a week of no contact due to the tension, I texted my brother-in-law, asking them not to throw away any of the gifts because I sensed that might happen. He responded with a threatening message, saying that if I didn't want things to get worse, I should never contact their family again. He also mentioned that all the other sisters had been informed about the situation and advised to block me. Recently, I overheard my mother-in-law discussing how my sister-in-law has been trying to coordinate with her about keeping me away if they visit. My mother-in-law said something like, I'm getting tired of her telling me who I can and can't have in my own house. Fortunately, my partner and I have been able to confide in my mother-in-law, which has been a blessing, knowing we're not alone and that we have an advocate in the family. It's heartbreaking, and I really struggle to understand how we got here. A whole family broken up because of a handheld gaming device and my willingness to teach my niece how to use it. I wanted to post this a month ago, but I got cold feet. I decided it's worth the effort because I want an accurate record of all this while it's fresh in my mind. Thank you for reading. Feedback is appreciated.